Well, welcome everybody, and in particular welcome to our Executive Dean of the Science and Engineering Faculty at QUT, Professor Gordon Wyeth, our Head of School of Mathematical Sciences, Professor Troy Farrell, um, AMC University member representatives, our program sponsors, our AMC winter school students. So as you can see here, we're right in the middle of a winter school here uh, for the last week and another week coming, and we've got 70 students from all around the nation attending, and they're here tonight, so welcome to them. And all of our other distinguished guests, academic staff and students. My name is Ian Turner, and I'll be acting as the MC for this evening, um, and it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to our public lecture on models, math, and the revolution in weather forecasting that'll be done soon by Dr. Peter May. Uh, before I go too much further, let me just acknowledge the traditional owners of the land. So we wish to pay respects to, sorry, I started wrong there. In keeping with the spirit of reconciliation, we should acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands where QUT now stands and recognize that these have always been places of teaching and learning. We wish to pay respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within the QUT community. Uh, I would also like to just mention some brief housekeeping in the unlikely event of emergency. We would just go out through the doors and uh, gather together on the grassed area just outside of Old Government House. And if though anyone's looking for the bathrooms, you just go through the glass doors over to the other building and the bathrooms are just on your right. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our sponsors. We have um, some wonderful sponsors that have been looking after us well for the winter school, and I'll just briefly mention them in no specific order. The Australian Government Department of Education and Training, the Australian Mathematical Science Institute, that's AMSI, the Queensland um, Cyber Infrastructure Foundation Limited, BHP Bulletin Foundation, Queensland University of Technology, Silicon Graphics, International Corp, Technology One, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, that's ASIMS, the Simulation Group, and the Australian Signals Directorate. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce our uh, Executive Dean to come down here and introduce Dr. Peter May. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to QUT. It's absolutely fabulous um, to have so many people here um, to listen to this very special public lecture um, and to, to have Peter May here tonight to uh, talk to us about uh, models, maths, and revolution in, in weather forecasting. Um, so my job is really just to tell you a little bit about Peter um, before he starts on his talk. So Peter joined the Bureau in 1990 as a research scientist after working in uh, NOAA in, and the University of Colorado and Kyoto University following his PhD at the University of Adelaide. His research activities included radar remote sensing and the applications to improve understanding of tropical cyclones and thunderstorms. He's led major international field programs including the 2006 Tropical Warm Pool International Cloud Experiment that included four research aircraft and involved over 30 research institutes. He has more than 120 peer-reviewed publications and has been the head of research since late 2009. During part of that time, he served as the Deputy Director of the Centre for Australian Weather and Climate Research, a partnership between the Bureau and CSIRO. The science covers environmental issues, climate, climate science, and the development of weather and climate models and applications. He's overseen the development of the operational systems that underpin Euro services for the major projects delivering climate information information. Among his advisory roles, he's currently a member of the WMO Commission of Atmospheric Science Management Committee that oversees WMO weather and environmental research coordination. He has been the editor for the Journal of Atmospheric Ocean and Oceanic Technology, an associate editor for the Review of Geophysics, and is the past chair of the American Metrological Society Committee for Radar Metrology. No wonder he's so tired. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Peter. Oh. 
Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon, and thanks, thank you, uh, Ian and Troy, for having me here. It's really a great pleasure and an honour to be to be asked to, to give this talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about models, maths, and, and the revolution in weather forecasting. And it's interesting, if you look back at weather forecasting and operational weather forecasting, back in the 1980s, the, the forecast process was essentially forecasters would take get observations in, do manual analyses, Manual, manual analyses and then use their physical understanding and, and conceptual models and, and analogues of past events to predict to produce the weather forecasts. By the late 1980s, numerical weather prediction models were becoming a useful tool and we were adding into that mix. By the late 90s, it was becoming a really, they were really seriously looking at these models. There was significant improvement in skill. And over the last decade, the forecast process in the Bureau has changed so that rather than manually drawing maps and manually typing out forecasts, the, the forecasters actually edit model output that's been, that, that's been merged together and then the text is automatically generated. And uh, increasingly around the world, it's that forecast process, certainly for routine weather, is being completely automated. If you've got a weather app on your phone and it's not the Bureau app, uh, pretty much you can be guaranteed no human has looked at that forecast. It hasn't been changed, it's just completely automated out of the, out of the uh, computer output. So how, how did we get to this, this, this situation, which is, I think, uh, interesting uh, and, and quite profound. There's, um, people have obviously been trying to predict the weather for, for millennia through gods, astrology. Aristotle had to go through with, with, with philosophy. But the real start of modern meteorology was probably the 16th century. You had uh, da Vinci invent, inventing a hygrometer, measurement of humidity, Galileo with his thermometer, and Torricelli measuring, measuring pressure. In uh, 1687, Newton published the uh, Principia. To this day, that's the, the foundation of modern weather forecasting, along with a smattering of, of quantum mechanics and, and uh, general relativity, as I'll show a little bit later in the talk. It was the mariners the, the, who really um, pushed meteorological science in, in the 1700s, 1800s. Um, they noticed that the fall in pressure related to the onset of, of storms, and there's the Beaufort scale from 1833. And in 1854, and I'll show my first slide, the uh, meteorological department of the British board was, was, was created. This, is, this was an act of parliament, and uh, amongst the, in the introductory comments, in a few years, we might know in this metropolis the condition of the weather 24 hours beforehand. The response was laughter. Uh, nevertheless, um, just after that, in 1855, the telegraph was invented, and that gave a methodology for, or method for transmitting surface data um, vast distances. And uh, by 1861, Fitzroy, the same Fitzroy of, as, of the Beagle, was issuing weather forecasts in, in the Times. And um, he was basing this on, on, on pressure changes in Ireland. And, and very, very modern in a way. So he was publishing these forecasts in the Times for free. The people were complaining they weren't very accurate. The reason he was publishing them was that ships were getting damaged in storms very, very frequently. And so he was publishing these storm warnings. The ship owners were complaining, the public thought they weren't accurate. The ship owners were complaining that the, um, the ship's captains wouldn't go out and they weren't making enough money. The ship builders who used to repair all the ships were complaining because they weren't getting, getting to fix all the ships anymore. And some entrepreneurial types were complaining that he was providing these forecasts for free and they, and they couldn't make a buck out of it. Pretty much the same <laughs> as, as, we are, as, as we are now. Um, unfortunately, it, the pressure of all of that uh, really paid a severe toll on, on, on Fitzroy. So how hard is this really? Now we've got the, the British Parliament laughing. In 1941, we've got Albert Einstein saying, nah, it's pretty much impossible. And even more recently, Stephen Hawking is saying you can't predict weather more than a few days in advance. Well, I'm going to show you this. Why not, if you take the right approach, you can do a pretty good job. So how do we do 
And so this is a plot of uh, how well our forecast. You don't, it's a, thing, a funny thing called an S1 skill score. A low number is a good thing. And the details don't really matter, except it shows the steady improvement uh, since the 1970s. The top line is persistence. So what happens if you use today's analysis to, as the predictor for, tomorrow, for tomorrow's weather? And you see the steady improvement, and if I'm right here, you can see some changes in upgrades in models, up changes in the way we assimilate data, and most recently the ACCESS, the Australian Community Climate Earth System Simulator, which I'll talk, talk about a lot later, which is the cornerstone of our weather prediction, our seasonal prediction, and the nation's climate change projection capability. Perhaps more usefully, at least in things that um, more meaningful to, to Joe Average. This is a plot of the RMS error in, averaged across the, the country of the temperature, errors in the temperature forecasts. Uh, one day, three days, five days, and our seven day forecast. And what's astonishing to me is, and this is on a time scale only over the last 13 years, so not very long, and the current accuracy of our seven day forecast is about the same as the three day forecast was just 13 years ago. To me, that's an astonishing achievement. So how do we get there? Well, we get there with lots of, lots of maths and lots of, lots of uh, physics. The idea is pretty simple. Um, no, basically, you've got Newton's, uh, Newton's law, force equals mass times acceleration. You had a smattering of the laws of, of thermodynamics and you make sure you can serve mass and water because you can't create matter out of nothing. So that sounds like it should be a doddle, except you're trying to solve these equations in a fluid. It's a rotating fluid. It's got a rough surface and the heating th that you apply to that fluid is pretty complicated because you've got the solar radiation coming in, the ground absorbing it, infrared radiation being re-emitted, absorbed by greenhouse gases, re-emitted and, and so forth. So it starts getting pretty complicated. Um, for, the, for those who are worried about lots of equations, this is probably about it. Um, for those who like lots of equations, sorry. The, um, the formulation of, of, uh, of Newton's laws for a fluid is a thing called the Navier-Stokes equation. And this is just a, a form of it. Looks pretty innocuous. It's a nonlinear differential equation. There's some pretty nasty terms hidden in there, uh, what we call the physics, so the, the, the forcing, the release of latent heat when you've got phase changes of, of water vapour and, and liquid water. Uh, and, and I say, I mentioned the infrared uh, being reabsorbed. And uh, so they really are, and it's really one of the, the classic difficult problems or difficult sets of equations to solve. You know, highly nonlinear, as Ed Laurent showed, um, you've got uh, mostly chaotic solutions to this. People do, sim have sim do, do simplified uh, versions of this, look for wave-like solutions and so forth. So, there's, so when you hear people talk about things called Rossby waves or gra internal gravity waves, there's solutions to these equations. Uh, I'll come to waves a little bit more in a bit as well. well that leads me to the first real hero of, of this story. And I use hero in a, in, a, in, a, in a true sense. So Larry Fry Richardson was an Englishman. He was a Quaker, conscientious, conscientious, conscientious objector. So he refused to fight in the First World War. <laughs> However, and, and because he refused to fight in the First World War, he was denied ever having an academic position. But he, he, no, he, um, he was really an incredible guy. He worked as a stretcher bearer on the front line. So despite the fact that he was refused to fight, he was there on the front line. And in his spare time, apart, when, apart from rescuing people, he came up with three key ideas about these, these equations. He realised you can simplify these things. You can, you can solve the intervals by approximating them as, as, a, as a summation. And that if you had these, you could integrate these equations in time uh, from a grid, from an initial condition. So the idea being, in his instance, just a single layer, that you estimate the pressure and, and, and temperature on a grid, in this case over Europe. The actual date that he decided to do a forecast for was, for, was May the 20th, 1910. And he integrated these equations by hand. 
well, in the midst of, of the carnage, which was the trenches of the First World War. So he did it with this, so, and he did it, and it was ultimately published by the Royal Society in a, in a paper called Weather Prediction by Numerical Processes in 1922. It was pretty amazing. It took him several years to do the calculation, but nevertheless, it did, there were a few problems. Um, his 24-hour forecast had error, pressure errors in Europe of 140 millibars. Pretty substantial. It took a long time to work. He didn't know about numerical instability. He didn't know about waves. Most of that is actually associated with the generation of large amplitude waves. It remains an issue when you're simulating data now. But he, was, but he had incredible foresight. So he said, perhaps someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance the comp computations faster than weather advances and, and uh, produce operational weather forecasts. He even came up in this, in this book uh, the idea of a weather factory. So we had a, you know, people arrayed in a globe each, each point. This is an artist rendition uh, by an Irishman, Stephen Conlon, in 19, from 1986, published in an article about this in the Irish Times. It's really, it's worth a read. Um, and his idea was that you have a central conductor and computers, pe in that stage, people with adding machines, doing the calculations and using these searchlights to make sure it's all coordinated. And so he thought, no, you could do this with, with around 60,000 computers arrayed in this big globe, this huge building, doing these numerical calculations. It's actually the first idea of a massively parallel computing. It's not that dissimilar to what we do now. That same coordination over thousands of in processes. Again, you got the numbers slightly wrong. You probably needed at least an order of magnitude more people. But it's still a remarkable, uh, you know, remarkable concept given this is in the 1922. No, um, he, he did a few other things. So effectively, he invented fractals along the way. <laughs> um, he, he, he asked the, the, the fractal, is he, he was asked the question, how long is the coastline of, of Britain? And he showed that no matter how small you made the ruler, when you, the smaller you made the ruler, the longer the coastline was. It's, it's the fundamental principle behind fractals. The next really big advance was uh, von Neumann and Charney and the first electronic computers. So von, Do von Neumann, I, I saw a quote, I haven't man managed to refine it. The, the, the quote I saw was he was asked after the calculations of the H-bomb, what, what problem should they try next with the, new, the fancy new ENIAC computer? And there's von Neumann up here. Here's some, some women, women who are actually doing the hard work of actually programming and running this. So von Neumann effectively you know, invented uh, modern, modern programming, game theory, a few other things along the way. But, he, but his answer to the, what's the hardest thing that he could think of was actually weather forecasting. And so he and, a, and, a, and a, an absolute giant of meteorology, Jewel Charney, came up with the idea, no, idea of, of simplified, simplifying those equations, what's called the barotropic vorticity equation, and we started producing numerical forecasts. And uh, that was published in 1950. So this work was done in, in the late 1940s, around 1949. The very first, the, the first people actually used it operationally were the Swedes. Sweden has a very long history of meteorological research. When you see fronts drawn on, on a weather map, you can thank the Swedes. They invented the frontal analysis back in the, in, the night, in the early part of the 20th century. But uh, a very famous uh, person, uh, Carl Gustav Rossby um, in, in Sweden, was you know, the first to actually use the, these forecasts and generate them operationally. So a key question. I mentioned the, um, the, that uh, Louis Fry Richardson took the pressure measurements and temperature measurements from around Europe. So how do you get that data into the model? Um, it's tricky. You've got point measurements compared with your model, which has these grid averages. And that actually impacts when you try and verify how well you're doing comparing grid, grid averages with points. Um, you've got very indirect measurements. So um, the variables you're trying to forecast and the variables inside your model are things like pressure, temperature, humidity. Um, when you start looking at satellites, you're measuring things like uh, the microwave glow of the, of the atmosphere. So if you're, if you're in a, you know, above the Earth's, Earth's atmosphere, look down, there's actually a, a microwave, a radio wave glow emanating from, from the atmosphere. 
um, and it has information about temperature and, and humidity in it. Likewise, in the infrared, and there's satellites that orbit with have infra interferometers, several thousand channels of infrared information, not very independent, but several thousand channels across a swath as, as the satellites are, are orbiting. So you've got to take into account these very indirect measurements. And you've got to do it in such a way that you don't break the model. If you, models, you know, as I've mentioned, the, the atmosphere is a, is a chaotic system. If you don't have a suitable balance at the initial state, all you do is generate large amplitude waves as the atmosphere tries to get itself into some balance and literally blows, blows the, the forecast up. So there's been a lot of work over, over the last 20 or 30 years around formulations using things called 4D variational uh, methodologies, ensemble Kalman filters, and uh, rather than trying to to uh, turn the satellite measurements into something f that you're physically interested in, directly assimilating the satellite radiuses. It's a major part of why our forecasts have improved, and I'll show a bit more of that in a bit. Australia's had very significant contributions as well. So the first operational modelling in the Bureau was back in the late 1960s, and uh, Bill Burke, uh, came up with the idea not of not just a grid-based model, but using a spectral approach. So instead of solving all these equations on a, on a series of regular, regular irregular grids, solving, solving them is a, is a series of global waves of various wave numbers. The very first climate model that was used, was a, was a, we developed, was a spectral model. The wavelength was about 1,000 kilometres. Pretty crude, but it was, I say, it's a long time ago, and this is what, what the computing supported. And uh, interesting to say, the first uh, geophysical fluid dynamics lab of NOAA, their first climate model was actually Bill's model. <laughs> so the technology goes all different directions. We've also played a very significant role in the use of satellites. Uh, John LaMarshall, who's pictured here, is still very active, uh, work, working for us, has been one of the leaders, global leaders, in the use of satellites in numerical weather prediction over the last 30 years. And it's a very international community. Everyone shares algorithms, the, you know, literally sh at the code level, we, everything is shared. And you know, other work, particularly relevant to the tropics, is making sure that you put heating in the right place. Um, things really blow up if you... you know, when in the tropics where thunderstorms and convection is really important, you've got to make, they release enormous amounts of heat. And if you don't put them in the right place, again, the model just plays havoc. So what goes into our models? And how, how complex are they? So if you wind the clock back to the 1970s, a state-of-the-art model probably had a resolution of somewhere around 100 to 300 kilometres, depending whether it was a global model or a regional model. Uh, but it was purely atmosphere, knew nothing about what was in the land surface and so forth. By the mid-80s, people were adding the land surface, and now we have very sophisticated land surface models as part of the forecast system. By 1990, for climate in particular, climate simulations, people were adding the ocean and sea ice. In the mid-90s, taking into account the sulphate aerosols, so uh, acid no, rain, but more particularly uh, affects the incoming solar radiation in, uh, in the stratosphere. Uh, 10 years ago, adding uh, other types of aerosols, so it's, no, dust and, and so forth. And in climate models, staying to include the carbon cycle, so how the model is feeding back on the growth of plants and so forth. Um, the land surface, you know, back in the, in the 1990s, you have to include vegetation. And so, you know, back then we had, you know, there was the standard European vegetable that was used across lots of, lots of models. Uh, these days, there's many different vegetation types, and, and, it comes to, and they include things like stomatal resistance, how much moisture plants are emitting uh, according to how stressed they are as part of the, of the land surface models. And of course, chemistry. And the resolutions that we use now uh, for our high resolution modeling that I'll show a little bit later is around one and a half to two kilometers. And our climate models are heading towards that 50 kilometer mark and much more resolution in the vertical as well. And while we're at it, we, um, we have to, we, well, have to, we take in data from something over, at the moment, operationally, more than 30 different satellites into our weather, uh, a handful more for ocean forecasts and, and, uh, and, and initialising the land surface. 
So it's lots of data, uh, lots of complexity. The, the satellite's really important for us in the Southern Hemisphere. In the Northern Hemisphere, and I'll, and I'll illustrate this uh, in a bit, yeah, for a long time, people got away with uh, using weather balloons on their own and, and so forth to provide the data. Northern Hemisphere, there's lots of lots of land in the southern ocean. In the southern hemisphere, uh, it's mostly ocean, and what's not ocean is mostly third world. So the observations are very thin and, and sparse. So if you don't have satellites, uh, John Le Marshall, the person I showed before, did the calculations of what is the forecast skill. Um, in this case, positive is a good number, uh, with satellites at, for a thing called the fi 500 millibar heights. That's so how high the 500 millibar surface is. It's a measure of the large scale structure of the, of the atmosphere. How good is that if you use satellites or if you don't have satellite data? And the difference is about five days. Satellites are really important to us. We pay a lot of attention to them. So what's happened since the last, I want to move on a little bit more about uh, what we've been doing since the, over the last two decades where we really have seen that dramatic shift in the, in the forecast process. So what's changed? The resolution for our global models have gone from around 200 kilometres to around 15. Um, by the end of this, this, early this, late this year, early next year, our operational global forecast model will be at 12 kilometres. The regional model has gone from resolution of the order of 50 kilometres to two kilometres. And um, for our weather forecasting, so this is forecast out to that like 10 days. I'll touch on longer time, time, times uh, shortly. And as I say, we've gone to much more detail in the vertical. So you can see a lot, lot better structure of uh, things like fronts, east coast lows, tropical cyclones. It's really important. And so this is just an illustration of what a global grid as you go to these finer, finer meshes. And this is courtesy of, of the Hadley Centre in the UK, this particular picture. <coughs> so what else has happened? The amount of data has gone up enormously. Um, so this is, um, this top plot here is showing the, the amount of data, data points that, that in this case, Midi of France, uh, our colleagues are assimilating and going from 2002 to 2012. And, it's sort of, and this is a log scale. So that's a factor of no, 10, 100,000, 10,000 times the data. And for a bunch of different satellite in instruments. Some of the key ones, these infrared interferometers that I mentioned, uh, is this air, this was this purple one. And the jump here is, um, uh, is the um, early on you were using just a handful of these 4,000 channels and we've been slowly increasing the number of channels that we make use of. So there's been a major increase in the observations network, uh, with, particularly with, with satellites. And uh, our ability to use these observations has been uh, dramatically improved. Uh, if you go back um, well, a decade or more, uh, the time, to all the observations at a particular time were taken, but there was no concept of using the time evolution of, of these observations. Now we can take time at any particular, take data at any particular time and slot it into the, in, into the assimilation cycle. So we have much larger windows of where we can collect data from. So we make much better use of the data by taking into account the time variation and constrains the models. Again, to illustrate how, how different. So this is a series of, series of graphs showing the correlation coefficients of this 500 millibar height, this height of the, this measure of large scale, uh, large scale structure, where the highs and lows and so forth are. And there's a set of curves for seven day forecast, a five day, three day, there's a 10 day one down there, but it's not very good. What the two curves are, the top one is, is the, for the Northern Hemisphere, and the lower one is for the Southern Hemisphere. And this is from the 80s going into the, into the mid 90s. And so because there was so much more in situ data uh, from, from the weather balloons in the northern hemisphere in particular and surface measurements, uh, the, perform the, the model performance was much greater in the northern hemisphere than, than the southern hemisphere. And look at what's happened in the, in the sort of the 15 years since with the use of so much satellite data that just drowns and dwarfs everything else 
It's not to say that the other observations aren't important, they certainly are. But the, uh, with the satellite data now, there's effectively very little difference between the forecast skill in the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. And that's because of the use of the satellite data and the advanced data assimilation. The sorts of problems that the, that the Winter School is actually dealing with, the sorts of technologies that you're, you're talking about there. There's a thing called the physics, which I'd say is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and the question there is, what do you do about phenomena that's smaller than a grid point? Now remember with some of our grid scales, particularly if you go back a few years, the grid, the grid size is say 50 kilometres. It's still 50 kilometres for our seasonal forecast system. The average thunderstorm is much smaller than that, it's a few kilometres across. And so how do you deal with that in, in terms of these models? And, and the answer is we parameterise it, which is code for saying what we try and do is based on the large scale, what do we think the small scale will react? How unstable is it? How much, what area, in the case of, of thunderstorms and convection, what area of the grid box is going to be covered by convection? How does that feed back? Because when you have rain, it actually dries the atmosphere. Rainfall, water falls out, the atmosphere dries. And so that's a mixture of simplified models, statistics, and so forth. Um, in practice, you always like to have a small grid, to, um, but it's not always practical. Every time you double the, well, halve the size of the grid, double your resolution, it takes about 10 times more computing power. And I'll come to computing power and how that's changed in a, in a moment. Um, this is actually a really, one, of, one of these really ugly, nasty problems is, is this parameterization problem. So, but nevertheless, there's, there's again, global effort to look at these, it's a key issue. Um, so since the 90s, we've got improved observations. This is the, the research radar that used to be at Red Bank Plains. We've recently uh, pulled it down because it's the operational radar at, um, at Mount Stapleton is being upgraded to have a similar capability and to be much more robust. Um, this is a, a picture of the so-called A-Train. It's a series of satellites, a constellation of satellites in, a, in the same order, uh, same orbit. They go overhead in the space of two minutes, something like 15 seconds apart. Uh, everything from having uh, downward-looking radar that measures clouds, lidars that look at clouds, infrared instruments, uh, the orbiting carbon observatory. And we compare that with what models say and, and glean what some of the physics and this is actually a cross section when there's H of where there's cloud. So where the blue is where there's cloud. This is an over, an observed overpass uh, from, from the cloud sat and Clipso LIDAR system. And this is the outer edge of a tropical cyclone where we've actually got reasonable forecast skill. And this is a series of forecasts with different lead times of that cloud structure. So, but we can, where it doesn't work so well, it gives you insight into what, what areas that you need to improve. So ultimately, by doing these case studies and looking at the statistics of the performance and of the models and so forth, uh, you get an improved understanding of the physical processes that you need to model and, and include in these parameterizations. And ultimately, hopefully, get a model improvement. And there's other, other things that you have to do, other parameterizations that, uh, that we use. Um, there's things called uh, internal gravity waves. So if you look at a cloud, you see lots of very banded structure in the ice cloud. That's due to waves. So there's up and down motion. Where, where there's down motion, you get evaporation. So you get a cloud-free area. Uh, they're, imp they're important because they transport heat and momentum around. And, uh, and again, they have to be t you have to take care of those in the models or you get the wrong answer. The next big key ingredient that we, that we have is, is supercomputing. So this is a plot of the bureau of the performance of the bureau operational uh, computers. Um, going again, this is a log scale uh, going from the the late 60s, early 70s, that with the, our first numerical forecasts up to our current machine, which is this dash blue line there. Um, when I joined the bureau in 1990, we just procured the uh, Cray uh, XMP. This 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 line there. That was a cool computer because it looked like it was straight off the set of, uh, of uh, Doctor Who. <laughs> um, it was the coolest looking machine. Um, these days they're not quite so attractive. I'll show it in a minute. But there's a mi whoops. Oh. 
Okay. But from that machine to our current operational machine, there's been a million fold improvement in, our, in the computing capacity. Uh, and, we, and we fill it up. And, we'll, and late next year, early the year after, we'll be operational with our next our upgrade of the machine. And that'll make it um, five petaflops, uh, which, is, which is up there. It's, the uh, current machine is a, roughly about the same as the current NCI uh, facility in Canberra except it's an operational machine. Uh, this is a picture of it. Um, to give you an idea, if you look at the number of processors and so forth, it's about the equivalent of 26,000 laptops, except you've got very high speed connections together. Um, the power requirement, this is just uh, one hall of, of this machine. There's, there's two separate halls, um, each with their own power uh, and, and so forth. The machine is water cooled. Oops. Sorry. So this machine's water cooled. If it wasn't, if the, if you lose the power, you'd actually melt the chips. Um, it's like it takes a megawatt. I won't tell you what our electricity bill is, but it's quite substantial. Um, so what about the next generation of supercomputers? All the Met services around the world are starting to grapple with this uh, because we can't. The way that the the scaling, you know, we've relied on Moore's, Moore's law to get that million fold increase in computing power, but it's coming at a cost of more and more power. And our, literally our electricity bills are, un, are becoming unsustainable. So our next upgrade will probably be similar technology to this, but in the mid 2020s, we'll be moving, almost certainly be moving to alternative technologies. We're not quite sure what they'll be yet. Could be gra uh, graphical processing unit, based supercomputers. There's a bunch of other potential technologies. Um, and a nod to Louis Fry Richardson, together with our colleagues at the UK Met Office, we've got a project to meet. Whoops. What have I done there? <coughs> ah. Okay, where's our tech support? <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, I've got a different screen. So we've got a. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, not to Louis Fry Richardson, we've got a, there's a. Uh, quite a large program involves universities here as well as the Bureau and CSIRO, universities in, in, in the UK, about designing the next dynamical cause, the guts of the model that will run uh, on alternative technologies that have uh, quite different characteristics. And it's, it's really a case of where the, I, no, the IT meets, meets the mathematics, uh, very different projections for the, for the, grids, for the grid and so forth. So I want to talk a bit more about the Australian scene. So in, uh, in the 1990s when I joined the Bureau, it was possible to have a world-class model with a relatively small team, five or so people. Uh, by the 2000s, this is, no, this is really no longer the case. Uh, what was more of the point is that, this is interesting. It's just done the same thing, but I must have pressed a different button. That's all right. Um, so the Bureau and CSRO, uh, not only did the Bureau have a, have a weather model, we had a climate model. And we had a different climate model, cl climate model to CSIRO. And we thought that was probably a bit silly. We were trying to be, compete to be the best model in Melbourne. What well, shouldn't we be trying to join forces and uh, create the best model in the world? The other uh, part of this is as, a, as an organisation, we'd fallen behind, particularly in the data assimilation side. So, and there was no obvious way with our resources to, to catch up. And I'll talk, show our resources in a moment. Um, I have the privilege of, of leading 120 people, and uh, half of that effort is in the model development. And the other half is either model users, uh, the people that are taking the, take, developing the tools to analyse the models, or a handful of people that are trying to understand the physics to improve the models. Models are pretty central. And um, Kamal Puri, who led our modelling program at the time, was charged by the Bureau and CSIRO to come up with a strategy where we, we could be world class again. And uh, we came up with the concept of the Australian Community Climate Earth System Simulator, which is a bit of a mouthful. 
Um, it's a national and international consortium. So the key partners originally was the Bureau and CSIRO, but the universities, particularly the Centre of Excellence for Climate System Science Universities, so it's ANU, Monash, Melbourne, uh, UNSW and UTAS, um, have invested significantly in this as a, as a, as a community model. Um, but that's not enough. Uh, we, it's part of an international consortia. So with the UK Met Office, the Korean Met Agency, NIWA in New Zealand, and an Indian lab, for, and there's associates. Interestingly, the US Air Force famously use the, the same model as we do. They don't use a US-based model, but South Africa and Singapore also use the model and then put some contributions back. The idea behind this model, this unified model, uh, is that the, it's a common code base for our very high resolution weather forecasts, our seasonal prediction, and for climate work. It's big, it's about three million lines of code. The Australian team working on it is about 60 people. And uh, as I said, that's nowhere near enough. Uh, there's about 300 people internationally working together on this, on this code base. So it really is big science working on big computers. The, the, the operational computer that I, um, I was showing is a, is a $50 million machine. So what goes into it? Well, first of all, our people go into it um, and their, their skill and their dedication. That's, again, across the Bureau, CSIRO and the universities. It's got an extremely advanced data and simulation, state-of-the-art physics, and it's fully coupled so that we can run choose to run uh, coupled atmosphere, ocean, land and, and sea ice. You need that to, if, to, if you're looking at seasonal time scales. Um, the, some of the forecast office area centres around the world, even for weather prediction, are using a coupled uh, atmosphere ocean model. It's got high resolution capability. Uh, we've gone down to a few hundred metres resolution when we've been looking at the, the meteorology around uh, Black Saturday. And we use it, use it to provide predictions from, you know, from days to months as well as for climate and the climate projections. We take observations. I'll say I've been talking about the satellites, but others are also important. The Humble weather balloon. Uh, around, you know, we launch a couple of hundred weather balloons every day measuring the temperature, the profile, temperature, humidity, winds, and so forth. The surface measurements, rain gauge measurements, radar, and, and satellite. Um, Radar actually is, is a new one. It's actually quite tough to assimilate radar data. And so our next upgrade is we'll start putting radar data into our models. To give you an idea of some of the sort of, the sort of coverage of the observations, this is just a series of maps um, showing data from various sources. So some of the satellite ones, we see the various orbits uh, here. But you also see measurements from commercial aircraft, uh, measurements from surface measurements, and from uh, ocean buoys. Um, from synoptic measurements and buoys from, uh, from ships. Uh, Satellite-based wave, wave information. A plethora of data of all sorts of different things. Uh, lots of, and lots of physics and lots of maths in how you uh, treat those. One of the really neat ideas that, that came up, you know, about 15 years ago now, was the use of GPS signals. And the idea is you've got these GPS uh, satellites, very accurately known location and, and so forth. And if you put in a, a very a small, low Earth orbiting satellite, uh, so it's spinning around much faster than the GPS satellite, uh, it's just a simple receiver. So this is your little satellite about yay big. And what you do is you measure the, uh, the GPS signal and you measure measure it as it gets refracted around through the atmosphere as this thing spins around. And that angle, that re refraction actually tells you the temperature. It's a kind of a neat trick. Again, it's one of these neat tricks that you can use the bending of the radio waves that propagate through, as the GPS signals propagate through the atmosphere to, to measure the temperature. Very accurately, it's unbiased. It's, it's very, very neat. And to give you an idea of what sort of coverage with the latest generation of, of GPS receivers, that's the kind of coverage that you get um, with these profiles. It's gold for, for the weather forecasting. And um, the, the Cosmic 2 is actually a, it's a collaboration between the Taiwanese, the, U, uh, the US, and ourselves. So we actually have one of the control centers for controlling that constellation of satellites uh, in, is going into Darwin. Our data is big. 
um, and becomes a real challenge for visualization and, and for analysis. Uh, the current operational models have a global model has about 30 million uh, grid points. By early next year, that will be about 120 million grid points per layer. So you, well, that's interesting. Yeah. I can't see what I've got here. Nothing on the screen at the moment. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so our total model output from our global model, our regional model and so forth, that's about five terabytes per day. Um, so how, how big is your laptop? It's about 500 gigs, that's about 10 laptops per day that we're going to fill up each and every day uh, of data. Um, within the next two years, we're running on what we call ensembles of models. So instead of running a forecast model just once, you run it multiple times with slightly different initial conditions. And that then gives you the range of future possibilities. So we'll be up around the 50 terabytes. Um, that's, that's lots of data. Um, our research data's, data sets are even, are even vaster. Uh, a petabyte, it's about you know, a thousand times, a couple of thousand times the hard, hard drive on your, on your laptop. Um, our seasonal prediction system, in order to assess how well it works, we have to run our forecasts over past data. So we do that for the last, around the last 25 years, run a full forecast cycle. That data set is about four petabytes. Uh, it's available at NCI if people want to analyse it. Uh, we do share it for research. Um, we're also running um, a high resolution reanalysis. So the, uh, a reanalysis is where you take a modern data assimilation system, the sort of thing that gives you that improvement in, in forecasts, and run it over old data. Um, people have done this on a global basis uh, for the last decade, and uh, we're currently doing this for the, for the Australian uh, region at 12 kilometres over the whole country and one, one and a half kilometres over smaller domains to look at things like fire weather, fire weather risk, how that's changing over the last 25 years. Uh, wind energy, it's, again, it's gonna be a great data set that we're, that we're generating. It's two petabytes of data. So we're very definitely in the big data, data realm. I wanna give a couple of examples of our, of our forecasts. So one of the things that we've been funded to do over the last couple of years from the, uh, from the federal government and with lots of investment from the agricultural industry is the uh, improve our seasonal forecasting system. So going from just that 10-day that forecast to multi-week and the seasonal outlooks. It's an interesting question whether you can go uh, into multiple years. It's an open research question with these models. So this is a single one of the, this is output. It happens to be a forecast from August uh, 2009. No particular reason for choosing that. It's just a random uh, forecast. Um, the key thing is our seasonal prediction system is now at 50 kilometre resolution. That's kind of a magic number when you look at mid-latitude mid weather systems. If, you, if you're at 50 kilometre resolution, you get things that recognisably look like fronts that aren't smeared out. Uh, you get things that look like tropical cyclones. You can see one barreling into Queensland there. Um, it's really it gives you some degree of confidence. But of course, this is looking at a you know, you know, month or, or two out you can't expect to predict exactly what's going to happen on that time frame. What you, what you can do is what are the odds of, of tropical cyclones, what are the odds of, of, of uh, heat waves, how much rain are you likely to get. Um, agriculture has invested a lot in this and, and uh, my colleague Peter Heyman from Saudi put, put along the lines of uh, at the moment our farmers are, are gambling on the weather. And what he want, wants to do with this sort of technology, this sort of information, is to make them the bookmakers. So that they can't, you know, they won't get it right every time, but on the long term that they'll make money. Um, and to do, get the statistics up, we, every time, every forecast we run here, we do this about 100 times to get a different 
iteration of what the potential future will, do, will be and then mash it together to look at the range of possibilities, what is the probability of, of heavy, of, uh, above average rainfall, what is El Nino doing, what is the Indian Ocean, how is the Indian Ocean behaving and the like. It's not just the weather, this is a coupled model. So it's got a full ocean model that sits inside it. So it's all the same deal. The ocean resolution is actually 25 kilometres in, the, in this model. You would have a finer resolution because the ocean has smaller scales than, than the atmosphere uh, because it's a much more dense fluid. It's got applications for fisheries, environmental uh, sustainability, the future of the Great Barrier Reef and, and the risk. And you see this, you see these beautiful waves propagating, this is surface, sea surface temperature, these beautiful waves propagating, you see the East Australian current. If you wait long enough, you'll see the Llewellyn current coming down as, as well. Um, we also have a global forecast ocean model on weather time scales. It's at 10 kilometre resolution globally. We run that every day. It's used by defence, but it's also used um, by shipping, fisheries, national parks, it has very wide, wide use. And uh, just this year, we're investing in a uh, operational storm surge model around the, around the whole coast of, of, of Australia and a system for tropical cyclones. I'll show a little bit more about that in a moment. And we have an experimental high resolution coastal model. So if you want to look at uh, or play with, uh, look at visualisation and so forth for kilometre resolution uh, ocean structure in the Great Barrier Reef, that data is sitting at NCI. It's freely available. We want people to look at it. Now we're investing lots of money to create these data sets. We want them to be used, not just by us. The, the next thing I want to talk about is show some high resolution weather modeling. The, um, we're down at kilometre scales. At kilometre scales, you can actually have thunderstorms in your model. Um, this is a real game changer. The other thing about resolution means that you actually resolve the topography. So you've got a reasonable chance of, of looking at the impact of the, of the hills and mountains, which is something you can't do in a 500 kilometre model. So I'm going to show you an example from uh, East Coast Low. This is the, from uh, 2015. And again, I'm just going to show a single ensemble member. What we're going into operations, we'll have many ensemble members updating every hour. Talking about lots of data, and I'll get to that in a moment as well. So this is the storm that dropped 400 millimetres of rain just outside of Newcastle caused ma major floods, I think there was a fatality as well, unfortunately. This is what our model can, how our model can replicate. And so that's not showing every grid point. What it's showing is the surface winds and the, and the rainfall in millimetres per hour. And so, oh, sorry, wrong button. And so you can sort of see the rainfall on the coast. You can see this band out offshore where there's this convergence line. This is cloud band out here. And you can see the storms coming up, rising over the, the topography along the, along the coast. And in a moment, you will see some really high, maybe we've just missed it. You'll see, some, if you look at this loop, you'll see some really high rainfall in amongst here. Not every ensemble member had 400 millimetres of rain. In fact, only a couple did. But what, it, what the, the range, of, but it show, what this does, it shows the range of possibilities. What, what the emergency services have to prepare for is the risk around these extremely high rainfall rates that are uh, extremely damaging. So I just want to look at an iconic event and talk about the communication side of it. So this is Cyclone Tracy, the, the track for Cyclone Tracy, which most people in this room are probably too young to remember, but no, I certainly remember it. I wasn't very old, but I remember it. Um, waking up to, at Christmas to hear about the noise, so the, the destruction associated with Tracy, where effectively all of Darwin was trashed. And there's a little loop up there showing the, ra showing the radar at the time. Um, so this is the warning that people got about oh, 12, maybe 18 hours out uh, for Cyclone Tracy. There's a storm coming, folks. You better be careful. That's about the limit of the, uh, of the communication, but the knowledge as well. And we'll talk about it you know, in the afternoon, maybe tomorrow. It was all a bit late by then. This is the actual forecast image uh, from Cyclone Yasi, where we're using an ens taking an ensemble, not just our model, but other people's models as well, to provide guidance for the, the location, the track, uh, and the areas that, that are potentially affected by different levels of wind. Uh, with significant amount of text associated with that, so I'm just going to expand on that just a little bit. Okay. 
So, um, so this is showing you know, a graphic. So if you're an Ennis file, you're probably pretty worried by that graphic. But if we get to the text, there's the emphasis. The main thing, this is a severe tropical cyclone. Really pay attention. This is going to be really damaging. This is going to, this is going to trash the place. And then there's more detail. What sorts of things can you expect? Storm tide, floods, uh, damaging waves, destructive winds. Uh, what should you do? You know, there's advice on the preparations. And lastly, how confident are we? What's the accuracy of our track? Um, and so forth. Um, one last Yasi, Yasi slide. Actually, I've got one more after this. And so this is just showing our operational model at the time on the left and the actual satellite imagery. And so the model, we're generating artificial satellite imagery out of the model, gives you some, some degree of confidence in, in the skill. And that was, the fo that was the forecast track at a whole bunch of ranges, the range of possibilities that we were, that we were diagnosing and, and so forth, along with, along with the best track. Uh, in some ways, Yazi was a bit of a doddle because uh, it was a big storm, went straight. Uh, Debbie was much harder, but the, the forecast guidance for, for Debbie was actually pretty good too. Um, our track forecasts, so we've, over the last 15 years or so, we've dramatically improved the, the accuracy of our tracks. Oops. Almost finished. Um, so at 24 hours, our track, if you go back to um, around 1990, our track errors were around 200 kilometres at 24 hours. Now it's down around 70. What we haven't done as good a job uh, has been forecasting changes in, in storm intensity. I think that's about to change. So we've been doing some work. Our current tropical cyclone model runs at 12 kilometre resolution. And uh, this is showing um, a plot here, this red line was the observed central pressure or estimated from satellite imagery. And this is a series of forecasts that's starting at different times of what the central pressure would reach. That's with our current operational model. With the model we're just putting into operations now at, much at four kilometre resolution, it's what we can afford to run on our big supercomputer. Um, there's still work to be done, but you can see it's doing a much better job on, on intensity changes. Uh, I think this is actually a game changer. Um, and we don't do just the, sorry, we don't do just the weather. Uh, we're running dynamical storm surge models, again ensembles. Um, this is just a, a snapshot uh, from Yazi showing the, the rise in sea level at the central and the way it's building up along the coast. And this is, we always check how well do we do. And so this is for a place called Caldwell. Um, the observation is the red of the sea level is, is a gauge there and this is our forecast, which gives us some confidence going ahead that we can do a pretty good job of providing guidance to emergency services and estate management. To, just a couple of last thoughts to deal with. One is we're not the only ones running these high resolution models and we actually operationally uh, mash not just our own models together, but, but to, you know, take advantage of other people's investments and mash other people's models together. And the thing with statistical post-processing, we bias correct and so forth. It's really machine learning in, in action to uh, produce uh, the guidance that the forecasters use to produce the, uh, the forecast that you see every day. Um, but the data is immense. I've been talking about just our models, and then you multiply that with the Met Office model, uh, the European Centre, and then you add global ensembles. So we, we're going, over the next couple of years, we, we're going from analysing eight models to analysing probably 80, 80 model runs. Huge data. Uh, the kind of applications that we're talking about is you can start looking at the probability of things like thunder. So this is... Um, an, a product that's used operationally uh, by our forecasters. So it takes uh, an ensemble of, of model runs, diagnoses uh, the likelihood of thunderstorms based on, on, on those model runs, calibrates it against, again using a machine learning type approach, calibrates it against the historical uh, lightning data from our lightning network. We do verification on the, on the fly and we also make sure that probabilities match. And so we compare the probabilities, what's called a reliability diagram, of the observed rates of occurrence versus what we forecast the probability. So 40% really means 
gets a bit dodgy when you start getting high um, probabilities because there's not that many of them. So I just want to finish up with a couple of thoughts. So there's been a revolution in weather forecasting over the last 20 years. I hope I've shown you some of the excitement and some of the, as well as some of the challenges associated with that. But the science goes back 100 years and say with some really heroic efforts when you look at Louis Fry Richardson. I'd actually regard this as a triumph of modern science and engineering. I mean, you think of the science that goes into the, the humble weather forecast. You're talking about supercomputers, some of the biggest computers on the planet, a vast array of, of of extremely complex satellites measuring all kinds of strange, weird and wonderful things. The science that goes into then turning that into information and solving these very high, highly non-linear um, equations. And then you've got the big data problem and the communications that go with that. But I think uh, you know, people realise there's real societal benefit. People make choices. These forecasts save lives. And I just want to finish with the thought that you know, none of that occurs without maths. It's mass is central to every single piece of, of, of that chain, and there's plenty of opportunities to come. And uh, small plug, that's, that's the, the Bureau phone app. Thank you. Well, I'm sure you'll agree that was a fascinating talk, very, very interesting, and lots of different topics covered, and I'm sure that means that there's lots of interesting questions out there. So who'd like to start? Uh, I can start. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, very Thank you. Uh, so can you say anything about, obviously uh, models which forecast decades or even hundreds of years ahead are quite topical at the moment. <laughs> um, can you make any comments about those? So. The, the model which we use, no, CSRO and the, and, the, and the Bureau and the universities use is a version of access. So it's the same model as we use for the seasonal prediction. Uh, minor tweaks in terms of resolution because uh, any, any model calculation you've got a supercomputer budget so that affects what resolution you can afford. Um, that physics is robust. The, um, the way we verify and, and test the, the climate simulations, first of all we see how we do with the climate of the 20th century. So you're not trying to predict every El Nino, uh, but what you're trying to predict is the general trend and the behaviour of El Ninos in that model climate. And it's not just us. The, when you're doing climate work, again, to get a, a big enough ensemble that everyone can use, there's a thing called a coupled model in a comparison project. And so the major modelling centres around the world run the same set of experiments, the same emission scenarios and so forth, because when we project into the future, we're not doing forecasts, we call them projections for a reason. Um, it's highly dependent on what emission scenarios uh, range. And so for this couple of model in a comparison project, they range from business as usual, which is a disaster, frankly, for the planet, to uh, scenarios where there's very strong mitigation and a couple in between. So, and, uh, but you know, we, we use a large number of those models when we do projection science. And how accurate are the ones for that in the 20th century? I think they're, well, if you, look at the, if you look at the range of possibilities that come out of those models, um, they map the observed variability extremely well. And if you take any of the forcing, if you change, if you take greenhouse gas forcing out of it, you get a very poor representation of, uh, but changes in solar variability are, are included. Uh, when you're trying to simulate the 20th century, you include the very large volcanic eruptions because that, that affects the incoming solar radiation with the, with the uh, aerosol in the stratosphere. Thanks, Peter, for the um, presentation. Very impressive, uh, very informative as well. Uh, my background is uh, like the health stuff. Um, I think one of the issues that has been really confusing all the health policymakers and all of us is how to well define a heat wave. From the uh, climatologist's um, point of view, how do you think? How should we define heat wave? And especially if we really want to see how it impacts human being, we need to see how to well define it. Yeah, so we've actually done some work. It was led by um, actually the head of our South Australian forecast office, uh, John Nairn, worked with, uh, with the health community uh, in, in developing a definition of, of heat wave that takes into account uh, human stress. So the things which really impact human health, uh, and heat waves are killers. More people died of the heat wave in Black Saturday than in the fires, by, by quite a bit, in, in, in Melbourne, for example. 
Um, and so that takes into account uh, both the maximum temperature but also the minimum temperatures because people don't get a chance, if the minimum temperatures are really, stay really high, people don't get a chance to recover and the duration. So the metrics we use, and I'd, I'd have to look up the details, combine all of those. But it's been developed in collaboration with the, with the health community. John's actually one of the collaborators. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, um, hopefully I can be a little bit sneaky and put in two questions. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, fine. Um, my first question is, um, it's obviously a global science and, and you clearly demonstrated that. Um, so what do you think about then with the rhetoric about America first? Are we having problems with the sharing of data? I know this happened in the past, in the 90s. Is it happening now that there's some tension there? And the second question I wanted to ask was, I know that um, the public sector has usually been, you know, always been leading this, but I know that there's IBM and Panasonic and things claiming that they have very effective and, and I don't know how reliable they are, but is there a future that they're going to partake in, in this space? <laughs> um, well, well the, f the first one is the, the global sharing of data um, coordinated through the World Med, Orga Med Organization has not, has not stopped, at least you know, going back into the 1940s, 1950s. To do a global weather forecast, you need data from around the globe. And the US, along with Japan and the European nations and, and other countries, have been extremely generous in sharing their data and continue to be. Um, and so I, I actually sort of uh, asked this question of the, uh, I was at the, um, a major meeting uh, earlier this year for the, uh, with the US and was talking to one of their senior people, which will remain nameless. I asked them that question, just how big a risk is it? And they thought, you know, in terms of the sharing of the data, because of that global responsibility and the global impact that if one country doesn't share, then the whole thing, the pack of cards falls down for everybody. Um, he doesn't see a particularly significant risk to that. So it's a watch point. Um, it's periodically tested, not just by the US. There's been other countries that have decided that their data must be particularly valuable to the world community. And the same, and the world community has gone, well, if you want to charge for your data, um, it's, it is a complicated space though because there are increasingly um, private companies that want to provide data to the Met services and obviously they want to do that for a profit um, and there are commercial arrangements for various things. So we, we don't own our lightning data, uh, any lightning sensors for example, we contract that service uh, from, a, from a private company. Um, so the international sharing of data, I think we're on, on solid ground. Um, the private weather providers are a big deal in the, in, in the US. And uh, certainly, as you say, Panasonic and IBM and the weather company uh, are making major investments in numerical modeling. Um, we're cognizant of that and the challenges associated with, uh, with that. Um, I don't see either of those doing high resolution uh, convective permitting models uh, over Australia anytime soon. Uh, but we're certainly cognizant of, you know, of, of competition, which is fine. I suppose it's ideal that it's like it's going to be issuing warnings or legal Yeah, so in Australia we have a, no, a legal mandate. It's something which we, the last thing that the Bureau wants, just from public safety points of view, is, is conflicting information in severe events, be it bushfires, floods, tropical cyclones. Um, if you go to the US, it's actually quite a, a complicated area so that you do have television stations issuing warnings and it can get pretty messy. Hopefully we don't go there. Yes, a very, very interesting talk. I want to ask a question about your modeling the, <clears throat> when it comes to the ensemble approach. And I was wondering how do you determine um, the range of initial conditions that you use when you're are going about uh, doing this ensemble approach to come up with the, your final answer. Mm -hmm. What sort of what what influences your uh, you know initial conditions? And uh, is there some sort of um, is it like a physical a physical thing or using um, some sort of a predictive uh, thing from previous measurements? Um, the answer is is depending on this, on where we're at and the time scales and and, and different formulations. Um, is error covariances based on, on from the previous analysis are used to, to seed uh, things like on, ensemble Kalman filters. Um, there's more just straight statistical approaches to some of our ensemble generation, particularly on the multi-week time scale. Um, 
again, with some physical basis to try and get enough spread. And increasingly, we, the parameterizations I mentioned, as I said, aren't perfect. And people have also used uh, what they call stochastic physics. So allow some randomness in some of the parameters within the, within the parameterizations to also generate more ensemble spread so that you've got a, a, a good match of uh, observed variability. Generally speaking, our models tend to be underdispersed. It's so uh, getting enough spread tends to be the, a bigger issue. Um, I've glossed over a few of the issues. The model biases for coupled assimilation is a big issue. Uh, we tend to make the ocean a little bit cold um, in certain key areas. And so that's an international challenge. It's not just us. And I say it's one of the wonderful things about our community and our science is the international collaboration that, it, that, that occurs. Um, so there's, as I say, there's, there is plenty of work to be done in, in all of this. I think, I think we might stop the questions there. Uh, there'll be plenty of opportunity for you to continue to talk to Peter while we have some refreshments outside. Uh, but would you join me in thanking Peter once again for that? And as a, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to give you this gift from ACMQT. Oh, fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank